Um, hello, everyone. As we say down under, good day. Uh, today, I've got a new guest with me, uh, Seth Andrews of the Thinking Atheist. Uh, hello, Seth. Good morning to you. Hey, good morning. I'm having breakfast as we speak. Talk about an informal conversation. I'm, I'm sitting and here with exactly all my little That's exactly the way it's, it's going to be today. <laughs> that's so, um, exactly no, the way it's going to be today. <laughs> thanks for the invite, my friend. It's I'm a morning guy, so doing the morning uh, conversation is actually a good one for me. And, isn't it like one in the morning where you are, something like that? I am. I'm one o'clock in the mo morning in Melbourne, Australia. But I usually broadcast in Arabic, so my main audience um, is in Egypt, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, those sort of areas. And it's about between two to four p.m. Uh, in different regions of, of the Middle East. So it's still daytime. Oh wow! We're most of my audience, and um, uh, look, I, I, I want to start a conversation by obviously saying hello to you, and I, I've been a, a fan for a number of years. Uh, watching your show and the evolution uh, over time. And um, I just want to start a conversation by easing into things and maybe just a, a, an intro of yourself and a little bit of background about how you left faith at some point. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm a former devout Christian. I was born into a family of devout Christians. My mother and father were like theologians. Uh, my mother actually wrote a Greek New Testament study guide. She teaches Greek today, New Testament Greek. Uh, they are Bible literalists, you know, a literal Adam and Eve and talking snake and a literal Noah's Ark and, you know. And so I was raised in that house and that, that type of environment where, you know, we were never given the choice not to believe. This is what you will think. And, uh, you know, they always framed it under the guise of go and ask questions, you know, challenge God and ask him to prove himself. But it was a rigged game because if you ever said, well, I don't, I don't see any Jesus here, they would say, well, you're doing it wrong, right? So you're welcome to ask all the questions you want as long as the answer is Jesus. And, you know, we had to uh, attend church, and if we couldn't go to church, we had to watch church on television. The minute I came home and started talking about evolutionary concepts, I was in third grade, and my mother was so alarmed that she took us out of public school and immediately put us in this tiny private Christian school, which taught a literal Bible and didn't bother with any of that evolutionary science, which was obviously evil and satanic and and uh, I was uh, kind of a, a, I don't know, I was a student leader. I was, I found myself on stage. Obviously, communication is something I've, I've really fallen into. And so the, the church loved me. I spent a lot of time on stage. You know, I was a spokesperson for Youth for Christ. So I'm standing on stage representing the nice young man, the good Christian, solid student who's going to go out and change the generation and take his country back for God. And I developed a love for Christian music, and so I ended up as a Christian radio host. I started uh, at KXOJ 100.9 FM radio in my hometown of Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I sort of rode that wave, and it became a really popular station, and I had a lot of success there. And then I segued to other jobs. And, uh, I was a video producer for a company that served churches, so I produced literally hundreds of fundraising videos for churches all across the country. We helped to raise millions upon millions of dollars for churches to build their buildings and fund their missions trips, etc. And I was in my 30s, and I finally, finally uh, found myself so dissatisfied with a lot of the religiosity and I realized I hadn't really done much of my own thinking about this stuff. And so I began asking questions. It was actually a, um, I mean, I'd had my doubts, but it was actually a Christopher Hitchens debate video that I saw on the internet and I was doing some graphics work at the, it was mindless work, you know? And so I like to listen to things in the background and 
I don't know, Christopher Hitchens name had popped onto my radar. And so I started the debate video and just was listening thinking this atheist guy is going to lose you know he, there's no way he could defeat god you know <laughs> and the guy that i was supposed to disagree with made a ton of sense i mean it was just like that that actually makes a lot of sense and um that began sort of that threw my journey into fast forward and i spent the next year a little over a year you know, going back to the Bible, going back to my theology, going back to the the roots and the origins of Christianity, the morality, the historicity, and at the end of the journey, I I just realized this this nothing here. Uh, I was echoing the faith of my family and my culture, but there was just nothing there, you know. And uh, so, uh, because I felt totally alone in this state of Oklahoma, here is is hugely religious. I mean, one of the first questions they ask you, they go, what's your name? What do you do for a living? Where do you go to church? I mean, it's a reflex. And if you were to say, I don't go to church or I don't believe in God, you are, you know, it, it, they don't know what to do with you. It's like you're radioactive. And um, I was desperate for community and I was desperate to be part of the conversation. And so in 2009, I started the website called The Thinking Atheist. I am not The Thinking Atheist. The thinking atheist is an idea that represents the rejection of faith. We, if faith is a terrible way to discover what's true. Let's reason it out. Let's seek out the evidence. So the thinking atheist was an icon. It was also a way for me to hide. I hid for two years, never showed my face because I was still working for a company that served churches. And if they found out who I was, I could lose my job. We could lose clients, which it was, it was just like all the dominoes would fall. So I was trying to figure out how do, how can I be a part of this conversation without losing my house and my car and everything else? Because I couldn't pay the bills because I got fired, you know? And uh, so I did the uh, website anonymously for two years and finally came out and showed my face as an atheist in 2011. And I've been doing this ever since, you know, I have a, a the video pr production that I do sometimes, and uh, we've done over 500 podcasts, radio podcasts on uh, the website, and and I've spoken. You know, I've been given the opportunity to take the stage and tell my story and tell other stories, and so that's kind of me in a nutshell. Right, right. Do you, do you recall uh, who Hitch was debating? Um, yes. Yeah, I was a rabbi. It's funny. I'm not even Jewish. Uh, but I thought, well, you know, certainly a rabbi could defend God. It's an Abrahamic faith. It was Rabbi Shmuley Botiak. Shmuley Botiak. Shmuley Botiak. Am I saying it wrong? Is it Matayak? Botiak, yeah. yeah. Uh, Matayak. <laughs> I, it's, it's funny. I, I, um, he's called the world's most famous rabbi. Yeah. And he was essentially doing a riff on many of the sort of old hackneyed uh, apologetics arguments. You know, the the 747 in a junkyard. You know, if a tornado went into a junkyard, uh, in, uh, evolutionists believe that the tornado could assemble a working 747, which is not at all how evolution works. And, and uh, he, you know, he made the Hitler reference that Hitler uh, was, uh, I think he actually said Hitler was an atheist, or he had aligned Darwin with Hitler. And I thought, well, wait, Darwin, the naturalist, Darwin, the scientist, Darwin, Darwin, you align. And so I thought, well, you know, this is a tactic. This is sort of this villainization of scientists. And there were a lot of red flags. And um, I didn't know much about Hitchens, but there was just something about his style that I, I found so compelling. He, you know, he could be strong and he was far from perfect, but he could be strong and he could be right there in your face and he could be defiant and and he was so well versed he, he had this encyclopedic knowledge about so much but he was also kind you know he 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 was gracious he, even when he was angry he never went for the uh, l mostly didn't go for the cheap shot or the insult you know i saw him debate near the ending of his life at preston wood baptist church a massive mega church in dallas texas i think they run 20,000 members and he was on stage inside a church and he could have just ridiculed everybody including the pastors and the leadership and the board of deacons or whatever but instead he was gracious and kind and funny 
And uh, he made his points strongly without attacking people directly. And I, I've always tried to take that cue. You know, you can go out and you can be strong and there's a place for mockery and ridicule out there. But, you know, you don't have to be a jerk. You don't have to be an awful human being to be able to be strong and to uh, and to try to destroy the bad ideas. I like that Ingersoll quote, Robert Ingers Ingersoll has a, a quote that I use as kind of my coda. He said, the more false we destroy, the more room we make for the true. And I just think that's just so good. And, and Hitch was about destroying the false to try to make more room for the true. And I was, uh, I lamented I never got a chance to meet him or shake his hand or thank him. But it's true that he, a, a 90 minute Hitch video possibly changed my life, that and a few books. So, yeah. Yeah, and it's very similar to science, that last quote that you mentioned. Uh, that's what science essentially is about. It's, it's not proving truth. It's actually eliminating what's not true. And that's how you reach to what's, what could be truer or, uh, you know, in a sort of a gradual way. Um, I heard a great, uh, forgive the interruption, but I heard a great analogy. And I, I don't know if it's, I don't know. I'd like to see someone vet this if, to see if it's true. But they were talking about people who are trained to spot counterfeit money. Hmm they you know they'll go out and and study the fake but mostly they study the real right they know what a, what real money looks like and that way when a fake comes along they're able to say well that's not accurate because they've already they already know what's rooted in the real and i, right. I kind of like that you know if we can go out and see what evolution genuinely is yeah. and how it genuinely works then when someone comes along and they make this sort of straw man or or pseudo scientific argument about something like evolution, yeah. we can spot it because we're already familiar with what evolution and the processes yeah. genuinely are. Yeah, it's funny the analogy about money because even though money we're talking about real money, even real money isn't real. It's a it's a human construct. <laughs> well, that's a whole other conversation, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> Very assigning true. subjectively assigning value to pieces of paper and saying that they're worth something, or yeah. or coins, gold, precious metals, diamonds. You can yeah, we could spend probably a week yeah. on that. Well, it's 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 a very good segue to morality because I really believe morality is that sort of contract that we sign with each other because yeah. uh, you know that you always have this argument about well, okay well you're an atheist now what is your source of morality where does your morality come from and to me it's evolution and that social con contract that we sign with each other because that if i don't kill you and i don't have to look over my shoulder all the time it means that we live in a world where we can go and achieve and do things without having to worry too much and that's morality in a nutshell you, 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 we 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 sort of agree together what constitute a better life for all of us together it does not need to come from a top down authority to tell me what i should be doing and what i shouldn't be i mean killing I guess killing was a problem before the Ten Commandments deemed it to be a problem in one of the uh, dodgy um, laws that it's, or codes that have been sort of uh, given to man. I'm sure uh, killing people at random wasn't agreed upon before the the, the Ten Commandments. It's funny too when I uh, talk to people who hold the Bible as the good book and the most important book ever written, and I'll ask them. What are the most important rules that humankind has ever been given? And they almost as a reflex say the Ten Commandments. And so I'll like, well, what are they? And so they'll be like, uh, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. And then you see them start to fade because they, they I mean, the vast majority of people surveyed in this country can't name even half of the Ten Commandments. And I'm like, well, that's just weird. Because if they're the most important rules ever given by God to humankind, it seems like like you know all of the lyrics to your favorite song on the radio, and you can remember children's rhymes and you know nursery rhymes and things like that, but you can't remember the the most important rules humankind have ever been given. Plus, the first four commandments are dedicated only to God's vanity, uh, which is stupid. You know, I mean, thou shalt not rape. You know, that that seems like something that should have been a Ten Commandment, you know. But uh, it's also a little bit terrifying that someone would have to be told that murder and rape and <clears throat> theft and those things are, are wrong. You know, when someone's like, well, where do your morals come from? 
I speak to the same thing that you had spoken to, you know, well, you know, the idea that we live in a cooperative society where we help each other, what helps the other then helps the tribe, which then helps me. We were more successful at survival when we cooperated and helped each other. And then we began to evolve sort of this pleasure mechanism when it came to helping other people, which further propagated that and then explains altruistic behavior, even the, the goodness that doesn't necessarily come back directly to us. It's, it's a pretty easily explainable thing, morality as an evolutionary thing. But it's foreign. This is a foreign language to many people who have been primed to believe that the only reason they're good is that it was handed to them. Even the apologists say that the reason that atheists are good is because we're borrowing from the goodness, the objective moral standard put in place by God, completely not demonstrable. They can't prove that. They, it's just a declaration, you know? Yeah. And uh, I found that goodness for its own sake is a lot more rewarding. I mean, this idea that I'm good because what, I'm going to get another jewel in my crown and I'm going to, my mansion in heaven will be bigger. Uh, how about good because it's good, you know, for, for its own sake. I found that much more rewarding in my own life. Right, right. It's really funny. A couple of days ago, I've um, in Arabic, I had an episode um, critiquing the Ten Commandments, and I mentioned the exact same things. The, four, the first four commandments was nothing to do with morality whatsoever. It's to do with the image of that particular God. Even the second commandment, it, it does not exist in the Catholic faith because uh, the graven image and they, they are in love with them. Um, with pictures and statues, as, as you know, yeah. um, and uh, the coveting, um, you know, they we're talking about coveting uh, w women uh, with asses and, and, and donkeys and, and, and uh, uh, bulls and stuff like that. So it's, it's a chattel. It's part of the position of man. So it's definitely in no way. I mean, you and I, within a couple of minutes, we can improve on these 10 commandments without any effort. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's hard for me lately, my friend. I, When talking to believers, we, in many cases, are trying to disabuse them of their faith. We're trying to reveal to them what a world beyond superstition might look like. And I have become convinced that insulting people and attacking and ridiculing and mockery on the one-on-ones that's not hugely productive because the backfire effect kicks in. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't mock just on the larger stage is normally when I, when I, you know, ridicule the ridiculous and roast the sacred cows, because I believe people change their minds from a position of safety. So, you know, if I'm on the big stage and I'm making fun of Jesus or whatever, Allah, you name it, uh, they are still not feeling personally attacked. They can watch from the shadows and they are able to sort of assess that differently. But in the one-on-ones, I try not to, to be too mocking, but it's been harder and harder lately for me. I, I've been struggling and I found myself when someone's quoting the Bible to me to prove whatever, I, I find myself referring to it as the talking animals book. I, because, you know, you've got the talking serpent, you've got Balaam's talking donkey. He's arguing with Balaam in Hebrew, for Pete's sake. And and so whenever they're like, well, the Bible says this, I, I'm like, well, you, I, I realize you're quoting the talking animals. But like, I, I know that puts them on the defensive, but I know it's at the end of the day, it's not probably hugely productive, but it's exactly how I feel. Like, you're, you're quoting the talking animals book. And... Um, I have uh, lately, especially in our current uh, political climate with the rise and the empowering of Christian nationalists who are all waving the Bibles they do not read, whenever they wave it in my face, I'm like, great, you're waving the talking animals book. And so what? So that's kind of where I'm at right now. I'm struggling to get over that mountain in my own life. I lost you in my ear, my friend. So no, I can't, right. I'm, I'm, no worries. I had my mic muted, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 getting very difficult for me as well because, you know, you want to separate um, uh, critiquing the idea from uh, the person, but it becomes very, very difficult when you have a person who's adopting these views and, and, and very attached to them. So uh, you're trying to critique the ideas and separate the person, but it becomes very, very difficult. For example, the last couple of decapitation that's been happening in France by Muslim 
uh, followers. Um, yeah. And you try to say, well, okay, we understand not all Muslims are like that, but these actions stem from uh, the, the the scripture. It, it's in there. Uh, and at some point, these people are actually following the rules. It's you who uh, is a cafeteria uh, religionist. You know, you, you choose the nice stuff. And when I confront you with the very bad stuff in your own book, you go, oh, I've never seen this before. Or no, you don't understand it. it it's not like that. They are, uh, it's almost like you always, whenever you debate Christianity or Islam with somebody, you don't understand or uh, the, the way they understood it is differently than yours. How do you get around a mentality like that? That is, well, always going to try to, evades uh, facts. Well, it's funny. We have been trained to protect our positions rather than be reflective. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, when I see, when I see the decapitations and the brutality and whatnot, and, and, you know, we we're seeing, I, I believe at this moment, Islam, uh, radical Islam is the most dangerous religion on the planet. I, I, you know, certainly Christianity has its dangers and we're seeing, you know, radicalism carried out by Christians. But at this moment in our history, I, I see Islam as being something totally, radical Islam is something totally different. But then you have, you know, millions upon millions of peace-loving Muslims who are, they've cherry-picked their faith and they've walked away from hate and they're just practicing sort of a cultural religion, really it's something they fashioned in their own image, something that gives them purpose and they're doing it their way. But, you know, I like that line that says, if you have to, if you have to walk away from fundamentalism, there's probably a real issue with your religion's fundamentals. Like, why would you have to, like, the people who are not acting out the Quran, they, you know, they've walked away from a part of their own scriptures. It's like watching cultural Christians, you know, they've walked away from, many of them have walked away from the homophobia and the subjugation of women, many of them have, many of them are women pastors, ignoring the verse out of Second Timothy that says women are supposed to be silent and subject themselves to men. They're not allowed to teach males, etc. Well, you know, if you are distancing yourself from fundamentalism, there's a problem with your religion's fundamentals. And, uh, you know, I, I, I grow a little frustrated with peace-loving Muslims and my own fellow a, even atheists here in the West, because there's a hesitancy to speak out against the atrocities of radical Islam, perhaps because they're fearing for their safety or because Islam has so effectively weaponized the term Islamophobe that if they say, well, this is morally wrong, that they are being painted as a bigot. You know, the word Islamophobe is sort of a conversation stopper. And I, I think. You know, Muslims are people, but Islam is an idea. And while people get respect, ideas have to earn it. And if it's a bad idea, a destructive idea, it's fair game. And we as rationalists and humanists, we have to go after that stuff. And Islam gets no quarter. It is no exception. Yeah, completely in agreement here, Seth. It's uh, it's becoming completely f frustrating for us uh, at the moment because the the peaceful Muslims. So I don't I don't know if you know much about the new tendencies in uh, the modern, the younger generation who are trying to live with Islam and 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 trying to sort of um, have the faith still intact but still lead a modern. 21st century life. So we have a new um, direction called Quran only Muslims who reject all the hadith, all the phony stories, all the weird stories, and stick to the Quran only. And then when they go to the Quran, so you have the the, the surahs or the, the verses of cutting of the hands and uh, um, lashing the adulterers and stuff like that, they uh, will actually reinterpret the, the word to say, now cutting doesn't mean cutting of the hand. This is a poetic meaning, means to stop a person from stealing any further. That's stopping their hand from stealing, not really cutting. And it's all these word gymnastics. I'm sure it's uh, familiar to you in, in Christianity as well, that what God meant was something completely different, what's been uh, practiced over the centuries was wrong and people got it wrong and this is what, what what God wanted. But it leaves me with the with the ultimate problem, which is a more of a philosophical issue. Why would an omniscient God 
uh, choose the worst possible communication method, uh, be it language, and prophets in caves who would see something and go and tell a story secondhand and uh, hearsay. Why? And, and consistently, regardless of failing, keep going at it without changing um, strategy. <laughs> It's it's absolutely uh, probably one of the greatest questions and challenges to fundamental faith in my own former religion of Christianity, the idea that God knows everything past, past, present, and future. He already saw before the creation of the universe the fall of Adam and Eve in the garden and the contamination through sin of billions and the creation of hell and human sacrifice and, you know, it's, it's the, the, um, the global genocide of Noah's flood and Jesus on the cross. He saw all of this meat grinder well before it, the plan was ever implemented, and yet he continued with the plan anyway. And then the idea that his method for communicating is to choose the same species that screwed up everything else on the planet, right? So now I, if you throw 50 apologists in a room and you ask them the basics of their faith, you know, original sin, Bible literacy, how do you baptize, the nature of hell, is hell forever, uh, what's heaven look like, uh, the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. I mean, you can ask them about anything, miracles today versus yesterday. They'll just argue with each other. I mean, nobody can agree. And God himself could just show up and he could prove himself absolutely, and yet he has left all of humankind to just bicker about it for generations. I, and, you know, you sort of mentioned this weird tap dance that the experts, quote-unquote, the experts do with the Quran. We see it in the Bible. One of my favorites is um, Jephthah. Jephthah is this guy who's about to go into battle, and so he says, God, please give me victory in battle. And in return, I will give to, I will sacrifice to you the first thing that comes out of the door of my house. Well, this makes no sense to me because what's going to come out of the door of his house, right? But uh, God says, okay, great. So Jephthah goes in, and he wins a great victory, and he comes out, and oh my goodness, what a surprise. Jephthah's daughter walks through the door, and Jephthah rends his garments and wails and screams, oh, what have I done? What have I done? Now I have to sacrifice my daughter on the altar. And yet the daughter agrees to this. She says, give me two months to go out and wail my virginity because I never got to get married. So let me go out and cry about this for, for eight weeks, and then I'll come back and you can cook me. And she comes back and he burns her on the altar and the aroma is pleasing to God. So I bring this story to the apologist. And my question usually is uh, capped by, what the hell? And they look at me and say, well, you know, Jephthah's daughter was not actually burned literally. She was consecrated to God. She was then committed so that she would live a life of celibacy, In but she, she was not cooked alive. And I'm like, well, if that's the case, why was Jephthah tearing his clothes and screaming and mourning in agony over the death of his daughter? It makes no sense. We see it with slavery, right? Uh, tell me about this uh, owning and beating slaves in the books of Exodus and Leviticus. Can you explain that? And they look at you and they say, oh, it wasn't slavery. It was indentured servitude. Someone owned a debt or had a debt, and they voluntarily submitted themselves to work for someone else. And uh, so then I'm like, well, what about the beating? Well, it was a different time when people had to be motivated through physical violence? What? <laughs> and uh, you, you and I share the frustration of watching the people who, they would never allow this nonsense in their own lives today. They would never abide it today. But somehow they've rationalized that in a certain time, for a certain region, in a certain context, it's moral and perfect. I, I find it monumentally frustrating. It's very true. Regarding the, the slavery situation, uh, my background is Egyptian, and I used to be a tour guide back uh, in Egypt when I was young. So um, I know a lot about Egyptology and uh, that sort of thing. There's obviously not a single mention of Joseph or Moses 
despite all these uh, sort of um, biblical uh, events, <laughs> biblical proportions event, um, uh, nothing of that documented. Uh, we're talking about a civilization that, that used to document everything yeah. uh, that moves. Um, the, the, Strange that uh, God didn't send Jesus to the Egyptians where his uh, existence might have been better documented. You know, instead he sends him to uh, the primitive Middle East. I don't, that doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, we're, we're, we're less than 1% of the population could write and read. And yeah. uh, it, it's, it's, it's uncanny and stopped showing up altogether as soon as camp quarters and <laughs> all that damn stuff. Yeah. But you still get the hologram. Apparently in Egypt, there's a church that uh, Virgin Mary keeps appearing. Um, and, and people are blessed and they're having all these sort of um, uh, songs about it. But uh, I believe there's a lot of dodgy stuff hap happening in these sort of areas where holograms and, and stuff like that would be at work. And uh, be people, gullible people would want to believe anything. Um, but to me, um, Lucifer uh, or Satan, Morning Star. I, I I know that one of one thing that we've got in common, uh, you and I. I think we both are avid um, fans of uh, horror movies, and I I figured it out there. Uh, so I, I'm a huge fan of. I love horror movies. I just would watch three or four uh, in a row uh, if I given the, the, the time. But uh, one of the things that um, uh, was apparent in the um, uh, in the um, in Islam, you see a lot of um, the, the the hell picture in Islam uh, is way worse than the Book of Revelation. The um, the Quran has uh, over fifty or sixty percent of it threats of hell that will melt your bones, and when your skin sort of burn, God will renew your skin so you can taste the the pain all over again and again and again. <laughs> I obviously understand that the people brigade are uh, trying to promote the, the the New Testament as as a more loving God. Uh, Jesus is slightly different than Yahweh, his dad, and he is the one that sort of sort of moderate the situation, brings a lot more love. To me, I've always sort of argued that I actually think Jesus is a lot more sinister in a passive aggressive way, because you have to live with the guilt. Forever. Um, in Judaism, there isn't really that sort of uh, hell wasn't as prominent. And even Lucifer wasn't there in the way that Christianity sort of depicted. So do you think Christianity is a took the, the, the psychological internal torture with yourself even further? Well, you're spot on about Jesus. It's, I'm preparing a show about Christmas and the nativity story featuring the baby Jesus. And then we get into the earlier pagan origins of many of our Christmas traditions. I've done a version of this. I, every couple of years, we talk about Christmas. And, and I pause it, not to sort of blow the surprise early, but I talk about how actually, what if the baby Jesus was the villain of the story? Why did the baby Jesus have to be born First of all, why did baby Jesus have to be brought to earth disguised as an illegitimate pregnancy <laughs> in a hugely Puritan time and place? You know, uh, that's a whole other thing. But, but the baby Jesus is part of a mechanism to rescue us from the torture chamber that God created. And the New Testament is the one that has the verse, depart from me, all you who are cursed into a lake of everlasting fire and damnation. And of course, you mentioned Revelation, which is a meat grinder of persecution and fear and pain. And, and uh, you know, again, the apologists have had to sort of walk that back. They change hell. Well, ch hell is temporary. It's not eternal torture. Or hell isn't torture at all. It's simply darkness. Or you simply die and you're separated from God. I mean, everybody's got a different hell. But, you know, Jesus himself is the same God who created hell. And it has to be said that, you know, we it's like there's a meme that the Betty Bowers website has out there, and it shows Jesus knocking at the door of somebody's house. And he says, knock, knock, let me in. And the person inside said, um, um, but he goes, knock, knock, and they say, who's there? And he yeah. says, I'm Jesus, let me in. Why? Because I'm going to save you. And they say, save us from what? 
And he says, I'm going to save you from what I'll do to you if you won't let me in. So our torturer has come to rescue us from torture. And, uh, you know, as much as people like to wax on about the beauty and love of the New Testament, he's the same Jesus in the book of Matthew who said, you know, I've come to turn a father against his son and a mother against her daughter. You know, be prepared to hate your own families for my sake. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. And so, I mean, you can cherry pick and find the loving Jesus, but you can also, if you look at the Bible, find the, the awful and the hateful Jesus who's prepared to actually turn families on each other as part of a popularity contest that he must win. And if he doesn't win, he will torture you forever. And uh, so I, yeah, I think it's very, I think it's a salient point to say the baby Jesus in the nativity story. And the Jesus who supposedly walked the earth for 33 years, the Jesus who saved us, that Jesus is actually the villain of the story. Yeah. Well, one of the prophecies that uh, I believe they actually have come, started to come true right now is the separation of families, because uh, probably a few centuries ago, everybody was just religious, because that's what you do. Even Isaac Newton, uh, the guy who in 18 months um, sort of come up with all these um, uh findings uh, like no other man um, had a sort of a cuckoo side to his personality where he believed in all sort of weird things um, but everybody was religious then because that's what you do that's yeah. you know it's very difficult but now as we advance in technology and uh, understanding of the world around us um, a lot of younger generations have decided that this is no longer um, viable this is this is this is not right uh, but uh, we're suffering from that. Probably a lot of people that I know uh, have listened to you and Matt Delahunty talking about your families. I'm a bit lucky because my immediate family have all sort of abandoned religion. Uh, but I've got my like cousins and distant families who won't talk, be talking to me anymore because of these things. So in, in, in this kind of context, um, what, what is your advice? How do we deal with the hardship of um, being sort of outcast by by the loved ones well um let me start by going back to hell i think hell is brilliant because it is such an effective mechanism for control because if you scare people enough you will keep them from being curious or from being honest about being curious because i don't want to go to hell like if i get this wrong if i don't love jesus if i don't say i believe the bible I'm going to go to hell. I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to be tortured. You know, this, this scars people. There are people even now who are atheists who still wrestle with the emotional scarring of being terrified about hell from their earliest memories. And then keeping people in the faith often is the familial and cultural pressure, right? If I am honest about my doubts, my parents will be so mad and they might shun me or shame me or what happens if my employer is deeply religious and he finds out I'm an atheist. He can't legally fire me, but he can find an excuse to fire me and uh, say it's because of poor communication skills or something else, but it was really religiously motivated because he thinks I'm evil. Uh, I've had college students who have sent me messages their parents were funding their college education, and they realized at this university that, you know, my the religion doesn't make any sense. And so they tell their parents that I'm no longer religious, and they say, if you ever say that again, we will cut off your college funding. Meaning that they're not just holding him emotionally, but they are holding his future hostage. You know, if you don't agree with us, you can't finish college unless you, you know, do something else. So they, they, he, they may alter the trajectory of the rest of his life. So I'm very well attuned and understand and empathetic um, to the challenges people face when trying to be honest about their faith. I have had no luck in my own circle convincing my family. Like, I don't even bother. I used to try to explain my own position because my parents are just horrified. They they just are so embarrassed and so ashamed. And, and uh, you know, they're like the encroaching army. And I'm a, I'm a house or a castle. And they've tried every tactic. They tried, you 
know, saying, well, it's historically accurate, or Jesus has been proven, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the Shroud of Turin, or you don't want to go to hell, or Richard Dawkins is your new god, or, you know, they've got a new tactic every week. But none of their arguments were compelling. And I would just try to explain to them mostly, you know, I'm taking this journey on my own terms. Like, I genuinely am interested in what's true. And I disagree with you on the religious question. I don't think that you're correct in this, but we can still be a family. And they can't relax until I'm fixed because they do believe in hell and they don't want their son to go to hell. And so our it's cost as much of our relationship. We rarely speak. If religion comes up, they always throw out some sneering jab at atheists or evolution. Uh, it's a lot of passive aggression, you know, where they talk about, well, did you see this headline, which actually proves the book of Revelation? Why no? Tell me about it. And so they talk about it, and I'm sitting right here just nodding, you know, shaking my head. Um, in my own journey, though, forgive the long answer, but in my own journey, I have become less about trying to convince them. My, uh, my journey is not about making my mother and father and siblings agree with me. I'm not even convinced I'll be, I'd ever be able to disabuse them of their faith. But I do believe that it's important whenever possible to live an authentic life, meaning that in my own, my journey is not about them. My journey is about me. And so I get to be me. I get to think on my own terms. I get to take the path or carve a new path or do whatever. I won't be shamed by other people for doing so. If they won't accept me how I am, I'm, I'll be prepared to remove them from my circle and I'll find some people who will accept me, agree, disagree, but there will be respect. And I deserve an authentic life. And I say that to people in my audience who are being shamed by their families and, and who are terrified that they'll be found out. And I get that. And I'm like, you know, you take the journey at your own pace, but you des life is short. And there's no evidence for a life 2.0 when this one's over. You deserve an authentic life. You aren't an echo of your parents' voice. You're not an echo of your culture. You are you. So find out what and who that is and be that without apology. And then if people are you know, professing conditional love, meaning I love you and accept you only if you validate me, that's not love. And you draw a boundary. And if they cross it, you have every right to remove them from your circle and find a family that will support you for who you are. So for me, it's really about your own journey. You know, take live life on your terms kind of thing. Lo love is such a complicated um, emotion and it's, uh, it's not usually, actually most of the time it's not as pure as it sounds, it's always mixed with that possession and um, multiple other feelings that um, this guy's amassed himself as as yeah. love uh, that we all know and love. But it, it in all reality, that unconditional, pure, platonic love is um, rarely exists, and and sometimes it does not exist until you reach a certain point in your life and, and maturity. So, for example, uh, when I first uh, and probably all of us, when we first leave religion, all what we um, sort of feel is is anger and frustration we want to tell the world we're now smarter and we want to show them how wrong they are right now and convince everybody and show them all the mistakes and errors and and then eventually you, you sort of um understand that this is a journey you will never change somebody's mind in a, in a session or two or three uh and you remember your own uh which is when i first you first saw a debate that only alerted you to the possibilities. And then from that point on, there was a, a whole long journey where you had to go through yourself um, and evaluate and do all the hard work. And it's not going to happen overnight. So maybe debates and stuff like that, they're probably good for the silent audience. You're never going to debate somebody to convince them. I don't think it's ever happened. Uh, it's going to be always for those who are sitting on the fence and I'm not quite sure about a situation. Well, and it's also, you know, when I first came out of the faith, I had this tremendously naive idea that, man, if other believers saw what I just saw, if I show them the verses in the Old Testament, if I show them 
you know, the, the science of evolution, if I reveal to them the facts and the data, they will, you know, they're going to realize that they too have been deceived and we'll all join hands and we'll all walk together out of superstition toward a more rational world. And that never happened because for me, I, I, I was trying to convince them with the data when they aren't making a data driven decision. Many of them are, they have a personal relationship or an emotional attachment, which is like, if I come after their faith, it's like I've come after a family member and they are going to then circle the wagons and erect the walls. And they're going to protect that family member. They're going to protect that ideology. They're going to excuse it. They're not really listening. And so uh, over the course of time, and this is controversial to a lot of rationalists because they, they're distrustful of emotion because they have been manipulated and they know that people's emotions can be manipulated in very destructive ways. But I think, you know, it's okay to feel something about the things we think about. And I think we, we need to also, as while we're presenting a better way, it's important that we also try to attune ourselves to the emotional centers of other people to show empathy and compassion, to represent the goodness that they don't think we have or can have, to live good lives and to laugh and to you know have a lot of uh, positivity because that's a living refutation to this thing that they've been taught. Well, atheists are all miserable and sad and pathetic and they have no purpose. And they look at somebody like me and they're like, well, Seth's pretty centered and he's got a good life and he loves people and that doesn't make any sense, you know? And it also, I think, keeps them from feeling attacked personally because we have, uh, you know, the the emotions that we're sharing together that are are they're not rage and anger and finger pointing and incitement and that kind of thing. Uh, it's not always, you know, it's it's not. This is these are imperfect solutions, you know, disabusing people of their faith. But I, I really do think if I don't spend a lot of time with somebody who's a brick wall right? They're completely shut down. I think I refute their claim because it needs to be refuted, but I don't waste much more time. Okay. Cause you're not listening. They are a one way transmitter. I think if they say something that's bad, they need to be countered. So let's counter that for the record, bam, but I'm not going to waste my day pounding onto a Twitter feed, trying to argue and convince what a waste of time. But if I find somebody who is just a little bit, the door is just a little open and they're like, well, really, I didn't know that. I'm interested in that. They might still be protecting their belief, but maybe they're going through a moment of doubt. Maybe under the skin, maybe they really are a little bit receptive. And so I try to plant a few seeds. I ask a lot of questions rather than making declarative statements. That's stupid. That's wrong. That's factually false. I actually say, well, how does this work? Well, how did you come to that conclusion? Where is this supported? Can you tell me about how you got there? Leaving the burden of proof on them. So they all of a sudden are having to demonstrate what they have just been claiming for perhaps decades of their life. And this allows those gears to begin to turn in their minds. So if I've had any success, it has been more with the Socratic method, with asking them, how did you get there? Where did you come up with this? How would you support it? Can you prove it? And uh, do it in a way that never makes them feel like they are being personally attacked or assaulted. But, you know, I'm genuinely curious. And I'll make the guarantee. If I am wrong, I want to know that. And if God exists, I would want to know that. So all I'm asking is for you to show me how you know. And I leave the burden of proof on them. It's, this is really good. I, like, I do love the Socratic method because it's actually pretty clever. When you think about it, um, if you are um, working in a, in a car dealership and, and you love a car and you think technology would sell that particular car and you're in love with the GPS, and therefore every person that turns up to this dealership, you're, you're sort of bragging about technology. Um, uh, and that's not the entry for everybody. Not everybody Oh, there to buy cars is because of technology. Uh, and sometimes when you ask questions, you probably unlock the key to somebody's personality and what will change their mind. 
uh, it, given the right. So you could be talking about the the um, uh, the scientific errors in the Bible, and that's not somebody would entertain too much, or that's not the key to their personality. They might morality might be the one, or it might be something else. So by you asking questions, open ended ones, you unlock the very entry to that person's personality and where you can uh, talk to them. But, you know, you'll always end up with that gunshot approach uh, both ways, actually, even for atheists. Yeah. It's like, I'm going to tell you everything that I know wrong with your religion and you choose which one will, will take for you sort of thing. I, um, I'm always interested too. a lot of times what I see in Christianity, this may be true in Islam and other fundamental faiths, but, I'll point out, you know, be like, well, how do you feel about this verse in the Bible that says that you can beat your slave and to the point of unconsciousness? And how do you feel about this verse in the Bible that says that you can execute disobedient children? And how do you feel about hell and the torture of people and whatnot? And a lot of times when the Bible becomes uncomfortable, they come back and they say, well, I'm, I'm not all that, whatever the Bible says, I, I know Jesus exists because I have a personal relationship. So th that allows them to say there's an internal conversation that's happening under my skin, in my mind and heart. And I know God is real because I know in my heart. And I'm like, well, okay, do you find that convincing? Do you think that it, like, if I'm listening to you, would you, would you want me to, to hear that and, and, be convinced that that's proof of God and, and be like, well, yeah, I mean, I, God's real. I know he's real. So I use the um, outsider test for faith, or I use the comparative religions model. And I say, okay, well, if I was a devout Muslim and I told you that I don't believe in the Quran, but I have a personal relationship with Allah and I know it because he lives in my heart and, and it's so real to me, would you find that convincing? And you can see them, they tilt their head like, no, well, no, well, if he, you might think that, but I disagree because, all right, so hang on. Well, if I was to say that Krishna lived in my heart and I knew it because we had a personal relationship, would you find that convincing? Does that constitute proof? And you can see the wheel starting to turn because for them, the personal experience argument, this experiential sort of eyewitness account is supposed to be proof of God. But if they were presented with the personal anecdote by another religion, they won't accept it. And for the first time, they, they may be starting to see that, oh, well, okay, maybe that's not all that convincing. And uh, then they have to go out and sort of scramble to find other quote unquote proofs for their specific deity. Yeah, Th that's why I'm, I'm increasingly now stop talking about the the nitty gritty of religion, and I've started to um, to talk about um, epistemology and logical fallacies because I think if you can sort of show and teach these things, uh, sort of right foundation of how to think, what's an epistemology, how do you know what is um, uh, justified true belief? How do you mean? What do you mean by justified? What do you mean by true? What do you mean by belief? Start dissecting these things, then people probably eventually sort of uh, sort things out themselves they obviously have that sort of capability but uh, like for example that anecdotal evidence and we know for a fact that our senses are quite deceiving um, yeah. th things that we from what we see to what we hear that's why eyewitness is one of the worst <laughs> it's terrifying of isn't it <laughs> <laughs> you know probably the, the the story about the um the twin tower and how they've asked people a set of questions a few years later. And these people have absolutely no agenda to lie. It's just a human brain does that. It, it distorts uh, information. <laughs> there is a, a television show. I think you can watch it on Netflix, but you should, maybe it's on YouTube. I don't know. It's called brain games. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. And they come up with different scenarios where they are able to trick the brain into I mean, it looks this way. It looks absolutely this way. And then you realize that your brain has been tricked. And they actually did a version of the eyewitness testimony. They staged a mugging, a crime in public. And they had a few actors in play. And then they had the mugger who was wearing a certain, I think it was like a, a red jacket or something. Yeah. And then they had bystanders, innocent bystanders. 
And so they staged the mugging. And then they went back and they asked people what happened. And their stories were wildly different. Their perceptions, their memories, everything was one. People were like, he was wearing a green jacket, or he was wearing a white jacket, or he was tall, or he was short, or he did, he went in this way, or he ran that way. Their brains did not process it in, in a way that uh, proved accurate. And we find this all the time. If someone says, I just know it because I saw it, especially here now in the era of digital alterations and deep fake videos and misinformation campaigns. I mean, we see it now. Uh, we see people all the time who are emotionally validated, but cognitively they're broken. They're, they're not operating correctly, which I think is part of the reason that humans like to latch on to conspiracy theories. They're a great story. They resonate with your emotional centers. You just know it because you know it, because that's how you see it or how you perceive it or how you remember it. So it's true. And then you go out and you broadcast that. And, uh, you know, we've got to find another mechanism. The human brain is an amazing machine, but it is far from perfect and it can be easily tricked. In fact, if you want to see how easy it is to trick people, look up Darren Brown, D-E-R-R-E-N, Darren Brown, the illusionist slash oh, yeah. magician. Yeah. He was able to, he's able to trick people all the time and they're absolutely convinced what's going on is real, but he, they are being manipulated by a master manipulator. Yeah, that's, this is very true. Um, in terms of, um, I'm just trying to going back to, to, to Islam and Christianity and, 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 and the areas where they sort of meet, um, uh, Prophet Muhammad, uh, one of his uh, um, alleged miracles is to he's supposed to have split the moon with his sword. Uh, his followers asked him to, yeah, <laughs> this is true. And uh, you, you, you'll find it really funny to know that um, Muslims believe NASA is hiding up the truth because there are pictures that shows the, the crates and the moon, you know, the mountains and the, the valleys. And, and they believe that's the crack. Uh, which resulted by uh, of Muhammad splitting the moon with his sword to show his followers that he was a true prophet. But they believe NASA is there's a cover up uh, because if they expose the truth, the whole world would convert to Islam. There are there are, these are educated Muslims who are. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard that. I'm gonna have to go look that one up. That's yeah, wild. Please, yeah. And this like I've heard about the winged horse and. Uh, the creation of man using, I think, the clot of blood harvested from the spine or something. I mean, I've heard some, but I've never heard oh, the moon. Yeah. The creation of the, the fetus of, and because that, that's one thing that they're saying, oh, look, how can a, 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 a 14th century um, desert man know all these things about medical facts? And, and they've got it all wrong. And that was the, the, the ancient knowledge at the time. And actually, at the end of the verse, it says, and then the next stage of the fetus is it becomes a skeleton. And then we covered up with flesh. So basically, you, you, you could be pregnant of a skeleton within, within your body. It's oh, wow. very laughable, but they believe that this is actually, again, and the medical community is covering up because if the world gets to know the truth, the whole world will convert to Islam. And wait, hang on. I mean, so 21st century imams are actually teaching this? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yes. Wow. Uh, and the, because there's no verification, the, I still argue with Muslims who believe that this is absolute science and this is this is agreed upon. But you know they're hiding it. The, the splitting of the moon, it's there. Uh, they don't even understand. I mean, we we explained to them in a, in a in a separate episode how did the moon form? It was a, it was a uh, you know it was a, something that had the earth uh, in the very beginning and a uh, uh, piece of the crust of the earth which had the uh, lighter elements sort of. Um, uh, ejected from Earth and, and went into orbit, creating the moon. And uh, the 24 hours day is a result of the moon st stabilizing Earth, uh, the, the, the tide, all these things. They just d don't want to accept it. They believe that this is this is not true. This is all um, this is all fake. Well, you know, it's an interesting t examination of how religion primes us for irrationality and magical thinking, too. I mean, we're seeing in the United States. You look at something that's irredeemably stupid, like QAnon conspiracies. This idea that there is a global cabal of Satanists, and they have co-opted the entire Democratic Party 
and all of Hollywood, including actors like Tom Hanks and all Democratic politicians, to uh, and they are all pedophiles who are in league with Lucifer, and this is all a precursor to the apocalypse, the return of Jesus, the book of Revelation. So you ask yourself, how does someone embrace and believe and promote something, again, so monumentally and irredeemably stupid? And in many cases, I think, well, first of all, we have an education problem in the United States. But two, these people are already religiously primed. Right? You see them, many of them caught at an early age to embrace the fantastic. I mean, they're already believing stories of a cosmic wizard creating a dirt man and a rib woman in an enchanted garden and a floating zoo and talking animals and giants and blood magic and healing mud that cures blindness and levitation and sea monsters. It's all in the Bible. I mean, there's a guy, Samson, in the Bible is essentially a superhero who gains strength based on the length of his hair. And people believe stuff like that. So if you are already primed to believe the unbelievable and somebody comes along with a wild conspiracy and you're, you're thinking, well, it's the end times, the end of the world is nigh, everything that I don't like is satanic, then uh, you are much more inclined to latch on to those types of things. And that's terrifying to me. My own mother shared uh, some wild conspiracy. I mean, wild. Ab I mean, e easily, easy to spot, bogus, totally false. You cannot demonstrate this. A conspiracy theory on the internet. And I thought, she's got a master's degree, right? It, she's, I don't, she's not uneducated. So how did she get there? How can she believe this and promote this? And it's because she has been infected with mechanisms for magical thinking. And uh, this is a challenge that's going to stay with us here in the, actually globally, I think, for a long, long time. You know, we'd like to think that, um, well, the people who spread this stuff, they're largely the unwashed, you know, they're the uneducated. But often, it's people who are degreed professionals, primed by superstition, who are helping to promote these bad ideas. And that's a real problem. Right. Uh, I, I've, I've sort of been wondering about this for quite a while, and I think that the, the conclusion I've reached, that this is really hidden within our genetic makeup, because when you think about it, the first man have survived for, for hundreds of years through um, the inference that the, the rustling in the trees must be something that is about to kill them or eat them. Yeah. And because of the risk analysis here, the cost of being completely wrong about that tiger or animal that's about to kill them and live to have an, live another day um, rather than being com wrong or have a percent being wrong and losing their life as a result, we have sort of evolved to make inferences like that and, and, and say, look, you know, just play it safe and, and, and imagine things where they don't really exist. And that sort of evolved from um, the invocation of all these mysterious powers that control. Imagine, you know, you're 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 an early man, and you see all these volcanoes and tornadoes, and you're alone and frightened, and you you want to stop it, but you can't. And all what you can uh, appeal to is that invisible power that could be in charge of all these wild environmental changes, and, and you're a victim of all of that. And and by invoking some you know incantations maybe you can relieve these sort of powers and that kept evolving and evolving so so deep down there is an area where i mean pascal's wager is is one of those things there are get people still saying you know what if okay i'm an atheist but what if uh, can we just maybe play it a little bit safe just in, just in case just in case so yeah. we're still which captured. isn't true belief is it i mean pascal's wager essentially says i'm gonna say i believe but it's not a declaration of belief pascal's wager actually is saying that god couldn't tell the difference i'm playing a poker hand so i'll just say i believe just in case but it, that's not true core belief and you're saying that your god would be fooled by that and would not know the difference I just uh, published a book called Confessions of a Former Fox News Christian, and I have a chapter that talks about evangelical conservatism 
in the United States. And there have been brain studies by uh, neurologists and uh, psychologists and even sociologists that have revealed that people who lean more toward that type of thinking may have a more sensitive or larger amygdala, the emotion center of the brain. You see, now this is a trend. It's certainly not a hard, fast rule. But there are globally people who tend to lean that direction are often just wired to be more fearful. They respond more to in-group symbols like crosses or flags, etc. They don't travel as much. They don't experiment as much. They are more prone to routine. And uh, they're more germophobic. They're certainly more xenophobic. They're more afraid of the other, the immigrant, the foreigner. And they enjoy uh, this sort of insular position of safety. And so when you live in that type of cocoon and you have othered everybody else, then everything becomes a reason to, to become afraid. You're looking under every rock for the encroaching of danger. Add religion to that, and now it's Satan. It's the devil. So everything that I don't like is Satan. Well, I see the immigrant, the non-Christian, the Muslim, the atheist, whatever. Well, that's Satan. I see the non-heterosexual. I see LGBT mar marriage, etc. That's all the work of Satan. I see whether or not you are a capitalist or a democratic socialist. Well, that socialism is Satan. Everything I don't like or am afraid of becomes Satan. And so they further fortify the wall and they further sit inside their pods. And we see this in the Fox News culture for those outside of the United States. Fox News is a hugely popular broadcast network that is really a, an extension of the conservative party. It's propaganda masquerading as news. And it's all about fear. They're coming to take away your freedom. The immigrants are coming to take your job and to strip away your freedom and infect your children. And the Democrats and the atheists hate Christmas. They want to make it illegal to say Merry Christmas, and they want to shut down your churches, and they want to steal your Bibles, and they want to ruin the, the entire country. And they've convinced millions of people that this craziness is true. It's, fear is an effective weapon and an effective motivator for the easily frightened. It's true politically, and it's true religiously, and it appears it's true for a certain type of human being. I'm, I'm completely in agreement. I think Steven Pinker uh, is, um, uh, has actually showed evidence uh, towards that as well, the different type of the sides of the brain. Uh, if you're right-sided or left-sided as well, sort of predicts what kind of personality you'll be, have, be having, and therefore you might have that gut gene uh, that sort of forces you to believe in things because that's how you're tuned to believe. You're, the, uh, you're, you're already got the disposition. Uh, but even things like xenophobia. So I do agree with you that these people are probably have kept xenophobia is a, is a notion that again it's it's a relic from our past where it was probably well justified that if you meet somebody who looks different than you vastly different they probably want to kill you and 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 grab your position when we're talking about prim, primitive man mm -hmm. and it's it would be safe to always to to, to stick to your next of kin to the to your group and 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 not to venture out too much and, and it, it was justified then. But as the world is evolving and we're getting bigger and, and becoming smaller and, 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 and things have changed, we don't need to stick to the Darwinian socialism. I mean, even the, uh, um, Richard Dawkins talk, talks about it. He said, this is just a mechanism to explain how we evolved. We don't have to live that any longer. We, yeah. we, we can go beyond that and transcend these notions. I'm interested in us as a tribal. I mean, we were humans are tribal, right? And I think there is there are good types of tribes, and there are destructive tribes. You know, like the atheist movement, and you know, it's impossible to define because there are actually a hundred different movements all going on at the same time. But we get together to share common interests and to work together for positive social change, and so you could call that a tribe or. If I, uh, you know, if I'm part of a, a, 
a group of people who loves to go to a football game. You know, we were football fans, so we've got that tribe. And we see churches as tribes. You come together, you've got a an in-group of people who love you and who welcome you, who will miss you if you're gone, who support you in difficult times. And, you know, we see tribes in terms of our own immediate families. We're going to prefer them and usually prefer and protect them over a stranger because we are tribal in that way. And, you know, tribes can have benefit in, in a healthy context. But you're absolu I absolutely think you, you're spot on in this analysis of the things that were protective mechanisms during the infancy of our species now often work against us because... Then as tribes, we're not thinking about merely, oh, let's get together and let's celebrate something with someone who has a like interest or a like philosophy. We are othering people to the point where we are superior, they are inferior. We have dehumanized them. And we be, I, I think we ignore the larger tribe, which is the human family. You know, wouldn't it be amazing if we saw past the colors of our skin and our gender and sexual identity and orientation and all the things that people use as an excuse to put up the walls and other people? What if we saw each other as fellow human beings on this planet? We are all evolved primates. We all came from the same place. We all have to share this planet. And, and you know, it's when I was a political conservative and evangelical, we used to freak out about the globalist the people who wanted to shut down governments and have one big planet because the the one world government well that's a precursor to the end times it's satanic it means satan's taken over and the antichrist is running the whole planet that's how they frame it but now on the other side i think although i don't think it'll ever happen and i'm not necessarily opposed to the idea of nations and you know having a home team i get that but wouldn't it be it, the the borders that surround my country and your country and every country those were subjectively drawn by human beings somebody went over and they planted flags and they put the stakes in the ground and they said this is mine and this is our tribe and isn't there a point when we look at these things and we think well how much of this is about othering people you know i am now what the United States is a great example. We are we love to run around waving our flag saying we're number one, meaning everybody else is substandard. We can't demonstrate that. Like we're not number one by any meaningful metric. Education, no. Cost of living, no. Peacefulness, no. Health care, no. Average lifespan, no. I mean, just one. Science and cultural influence, no, no, no. Like, but, but we have convinced ourselves that we're great because we say we're great. And we have othered other parts of the world, our fellow human beings. And I've come to this moment in my life when I think, you know, I'd like to see us think less about the borders that somebody else drew for us. And think more about how can we be inclusive and connect with the humanity of people who are wildly diverse and live in other parts of the world as part of the human condition. Do I think it'll ever happen? No. Do I think it's a goal worth working toward? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. Look, I completely agree, but I might say something that you might disagree with for the first time in this conversation, uh, but it might, you might not. Um, um, let, let me try to convince you. Um, so I think humanity tried to, to fix this problem. Obviously, the, the, the history of slavery has been horrible, absolutely horrid, the way uh, they were sort of sent to the United States from Africa and, you know, chained. And we see uh, a lot of movies sort of depict that from Amistad to um, Django Unchained and all these sort of epic movies that show the the, the horrible uh, treatment just within the U.S. Imagine elsewhere. It's, it's a, uh, humanity should be ashamed of that. But the remedy of that, I think it's also wrong. So positive positive discrimination if you're a minority you're f therefore should have the advantage at the quota uh, you need to have that many women working for your organization and that many uh isn't this the wrong way because what is happening at the, as a result you end up with minorities f uh, leaving their home countries and creating a little china and uh, many vietnam and many and, and end up living in ghettos 
and probably not learning the language of their new adopted countries, not disseminating at all. Because to me, uh, a cult, like I'm, I've got an Egyptian background, but I've completely embraced uh, the, the world's culture. I can speak the different languages I can speak. I can relate the, to the different sense of humors, and I can uh, understand all of that. And all what I'm trying to do is 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 make that tribe that you were referring to a bit bigger that uh, includes humanity and recently i've become vegetarian so i want to include the animal kingdom in, into our little world um and um to, to me the way we're doing this we're still doing it wrong we're thinking okay we're feeling a bit guilty about what we've done in the past so therefore we're just going to overpay and overcompensate in a way that is not the black people are not going to be helped by being given extra advantages because they're never going to learn how to to fish. We keep giving, giving them fish, like the Maoris and the Aborigines in Australia. Um, there is there is a time where people have to take responsibility and actually become their own and do something and elevate themselves to be part of humanity again. What do you think of this reading? Well, this is a hugely complex machine, and I think it's often situational. I I don't I like the idea of drawing attention to marginalized groups. So if we see Black Lives Matter, which I support, it is not a declaration that other lives don't matter or we're not trying to spoon feed or give a handout to specific people, but we are. I think the goal is for in my mind the goal is not that everyone is the same at the finish line. Uh, because we live in a society where people simply are not going, you have people who are going to be more or less talented, who are going to be more or less hardworking, who are going to take more or less risks, who are going to go out and participate more or less in society. It's not my responsibility to make sure everybody finishes the finish line. I think because some people are simply not going to assume the responsibilities of being a human being, they're not going to go out and and blaze a trail and create and do the things that other people might do. So the finish line's not my fault, but I do like the idea of trying to make the starting line equal for everybody. So if you see people who have been marginalized because of the color of their skin or because of their sexual identity or political identity or religious identity or not religious identity, I like the idea of drawing a circle around that and saying, our goal is to make them equal. Because I see them as behind the curve. Right now, they're being marginalized and cast off and cut out. So, I mean, if identity politics, I, I think, has some utility, I think that there is a concern that if you only funnel resources their way, and if you're always apologize, I'd like, I, I didn't enslave anybody, right? So I'm not going to apologize for an action that I did not do. Because I I've never wanted to own it. I don't. I'm not that guy. I was not a plantation owner. I'm I'm not a person who denied black people the vote in the 1950s. I'm not that guy. I was born long after. But I think you know, as human beings, if we see a long injustice that has been done, we as a society can say, well, how can we right that wrong? And how can we create equilibrium? How can we try to cor course correct? And you know, there's no simple solution for doing that. Uh, I do understand your point, though, that if you're only swatting at the symptoms and if you're only sort of throwing cash or resources at at perhaps the symptoms without cultivating also a sense of you're going to have to participate in the process and you don't get to use your demographic totally as an excuse not to participate in the solution. You know, it's not popular to say there is some truth to that. But I like the idea of, you know, an atheist is a great example in my country. Atheists are distrusted to this massive. So we are fighting as a group not to try to be at the same at the finish line. We just want an equal shot at the beginning. We want to be able to participate in the in the political process. We want to be represented by our government. We, we don't want to be othered by other people as less. I think there was a statistic that came out. 57% of evangelical Protestant Americans think that you have to be an evangelical Protestant to be a good American or even be a citizen. So how do you correct that? Well, we're going to have to draw attention to the group and try to create a better opportunity for that group at the starting line. Forgive the long answer. 
uh, because there's no good answer. There's just all of these little gears in the machine. So no, but I, I don't I, have I, a catch-all solution. No, I think I agree. This is a very nice and effective analogy. The uh, You see a 100-meter sprint, and you see everybody starting from the same line. Where they finish, it's based on their own responsibility, how seriously they're taking the race, uh, their capabilities, their training beforehand. Um, have they been training um, better than others? Have they been preparing? Uh, so all what you can do as a decent human being is make sure uh, very strongly that they all start at an equal footing where they finish. It's the responsibility of everybody else. I think this is very logical. And if we can achieve that, I think we would uh, would be well better off for sure. You know, it's hard to because you know inequality helps a lot of people. You know, if you're a Christian nationalist, are you waking up in the morning saying, I'd like to share equal opportunity with everybody else, the Muslim and the Sikh and the Jainist and the secular and the atheist, and I can't wait to share and have an equal opportunity with them. No, if you're a Christian nationalist, your interest is to protect and consolidate power. And how do you do that? Well, you lock everybody else out of the game or you make them second class citizens, you know? And I think as long as there is self interest and as long as there is corruption and power and privilege, you're going to see people who have a vested interest in keeping other people down. And uh, that's, you know, that's a challenge. I mean, I want to see a country where, you know, the rule of the day is not that they're screaming that we are a Judeo Christian country because we're not, or they're co-opting the constitution to try to other people, or they're discriminating against my fellow human beings because they don't fit into the book of Exodus, you know, but those people have a vested interest in protecting their own power. And so we're going to have to rise up and do battle against this mentality. And it's a long, hard fight ahead of us. Oh, completely agree. This, this, this is even something beyond religion. This is sort of ingrained in humanity yeah. and uh, sort of accumulating wealth and all what you can have. But it's very short-sighted because it's almost like um, uh, the rest of the world sort of uh, exporting their pollution and all their plastic to China for them to take care of and not realizing that China is part of the world and we live under the same sort of sky and, and globe. So eventually all this problem is going to come back and it's like spitting in the wind. It's going to come and hit you in the face eventually. <laughs> it's like watching, you know, I mean, you can speak to this better than I certainly can, but you know, these Islamic theocracies, I mean, they're, they love power. They're in control. They run the show. They run people's lives. They, and if you don't, toe the line you could lose your head uh, i don't know what the solution is to i, I know there's uh, as i understand it a vast underground of skeptics and non-believers in those countries you know they're in the shadows they're in the basements you know they're trying to they're trying to get out but how do we liberate them against their oppressors how do we solve that problem? Uh, and I wish I had a solution. It's so Seth, um, um, I was part of the Egyptian revolution in 2011. So I went to Tahrir Square, you know, the big Arab Spring thing, and I uh, was feeling all sort of platonic and romantic about, you know, uh, being part of an evolution and new regime. But I've realized one uh, horrible thing towards the end as everything came, you know, came crashing, um, that... The, those presidents and those dictators stem from the society. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think these cultures deserve more than what they've got at the moment because they are within themselves corrupt and do pretty much in their daily practice what these leaders would do. Really? What happens is you need to have a, a, a bottom-up um, uh, change. If When the society change, um, it will actually end up, you'll end up having a leader that comes from within the same society that already has the, the right principles and the right heart in the right place. But unfortunately, those sort of societies uh, right now, uh, for example, you know, you have Iraq and the U.S. of, you know, they've, they've kept keep kept blaming the U.S. for being the, the root of all problems and the, they've done everything wrong in, in their country. Okay, the U.S. have withdrawn now, they're gone, and they're killing each other like no tomorrow. Um the, the problem is ingrained. It's it's within. Uh, the, there will be only a change when people change. That's why we try to change the foundation, the, the bottom line, 
where people can then, I think this is, we're talking generations here. It's not going to happen overnight, but it has to happen for the right reasons. When Europe came out of the, uh, the dark uh, sort of era of its history, it was not a change because somebody like Ataturk in Turkey or some dictator who imposed the, the right rules. I think if you do so, that will happen for a generation or two and people will always revert back. You need to have the people changing and then you'll end up having a leader come from within, just like the U.S. situation right now. And I think it's a good time to talk about the elections because it's a, it's the whole world is going to be watching. Um, uh, we, you know, some people think the U.S. had it coming for a while to end up with somebody like Trump, and maybe this is a good thing because this is a wake-up call. Hey, we can do way better than this, way better. This is the nation that almost saved the planet at some point, you know, uh, from uh, a war. And it stood up for something at some point. The Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, is one of the best written documents I've ever read in my life, way better than the Bible. What is happening? Well, I was going to ask you, uh, maybe uh, I may need asylum, you know, in the coming day. I don't know, I was just going to say, if you have a guest room, maybe I could come stay with, because we're terrified in the United States. You know, Trump is a symptom of the greater problem. Uh, he has, I think, you know, Trump's a known quantity. We've, uh, those who have been honestly looking have known he was a sociopath and a con man and corrupt and a predator. We've known that his whole life. What's interesting though, is to see a culture that is alarmingly anti-education, that is primed by their religion for authoritarian thinking. Remember that Christianity is primed for savior figures. And when they see someone that they have convinced themselves is even as, as horrible as he is, as long as they believe that their God has appointed him and they've been primed as well to see everything Democrat as satanic. So now whatever Trump does, no matter how awful he is, at least he's not satanic. So this is how they reason, many of them reason their way through the support of a guy who is the antithesis of all the values that they would expect in a spouse or a son or a, you know, a friend or a boss or a coworker. But, you know, when Donald Trump ignores the rule of law and the constitution and he acts like a king instead of a president, they are primed to admire that. He's tough. He doesn't care about what people think. And because he's anointed by God and he's on my side, he's a winner. Therefore, I'm a winner. He's going to carry us. And because they are also primed toward those in-group symbols that we spoke about earlier, when he literally wraps his arms around the flag, that resonates. Uh, when he stands in front of the church, he does not attend to hold up a Bible. He does not read. They see the Bible. That in-group symbol then reinforces them. And uh, these are terrifying times because this culture of ignorance and xenophobia and um, blind nationalism now feels empowered. And I think history is going to judge us harshly for allowing this man access to the halls of power. I don't know what's going to happen during the election, uh, except I, I do have this prediction that if Trump loses... Uh, if he wins by a little bit, he'll say he should have won by much more, and it was fake. Uh, but I told you so. If he loses by a little bit, he will cry fraud because he should have won, and it was shouldn't have been that close. And if he loses by a lot, he'll say there's no way a man as adored and popular as he was will have lost by that much. Reg no matter what happens, he's going to say that he's the winner. And he may have to be dragged out of the White House kicking and screaming mm -hmm. as people who supposedly embrace democracy and the democratic process cheer and perhaps fire their weapons into the air or worse at each other because they believe it's all part of a coup or a conspiracy. Uh, we, I'm genuinely terrified. I do hope that as the, the fog settles, that some of these people will come to their senses and realize what they've done. But I don't have a tremendous sense of optimism. And the fact that Donald Trump, after four years of rampant and nonstop awfulness, 
still commands the allegiance of tens of millions of American voters, I think is an indictment of the entire United States. And um, the, the, like what you've said, this will be generations. It's going to take us generations to recover from what has happened over the last half decade. Do, do you think Biden is the right person to to stand again uh, against him? Or I, I, Biden's a terrible candidate. Like I, he does nothing for me in terms of like I'm. He's not. He does not have. I was looking at the candidates well before the Democratic nominee was chosen, and there were so many others that would have been much better, in my opinion. But if you look in terms of Comparing one man against the other, there's a false equivalence argument that people like to toss out in the United States, that they're both equally bad or both parties are equally bad. And that's just crap. You know, There is one party right now that is uh, yelling the name of God and claiming ownership on everything, and that's the Republicans. There is uh, one party that's dragging uh, evangelists into the Oval Office that's supposed to represent everybody of all religions and none. And that's the Republican Party. There's one uh, uh, party that's stacking the Supreme Court with evangelical zealots who believe the Bible is the ultimate law and authority, and that's the Republicans. There's one party that's discriminating against uh, LGBT Americans and minimizing Black Lives Matter and, and Black people in general and, and not properly condemning or even celebrating white supremacists, and white nationalists. There's, there's no equivalence going on here. So for me, the Democratic Party, and by default, the Democratic candidate, they are an easy yes vote for me. And while Biden is a lackluster candidate, I believe in my heart he is the far better human being. He represents humanism. He represents inclusion, positivity. He is far from perfect, but right now the perfect is the enemy of the good. The patient is bleeding arterially. We have to stop the bleeding. Yeah. Once we then rescue the patient, then we can figure out how to move forward in the days, months, and years ahead. Yeah. In inviting evangelical Christianity is such a scene. I think I remember a scene at the Oval Office where he was sitting down and he had the hands of different evangelical Christians sort of praying. He's closing his eyes. It sounds like he's reading something, but I don't think he, he ever read. I don't think he's actually um, a, a Christian or or uh, he doesn't. I would pay, a th I, I on record, I would pay $1,000 of my own savings account. I would take money out of my own savings. I would pay a thousand dollars to sit Donald Trump down for two minutes and give him a basic Bible knowledge quiz. Yes. All right. Oh. I would ask him the most rudimentary basic questions of his Bible, knowing that he doesn't know anything yes. about Christianity or its holy book. And when you see him at the Oval Office, in an office that we pay for, and he's surrounded by evangelical Christian nationalists who are all touching him and anointing him. What message does that send to everybody else? It's saying that they own the country and the rest of us are there at their pleasure. Yeah. And we are essentially second-class citizens. It is a huge breach of the Constitution, and it's hugely un-American. And yet, if you are a Christian nationalist, you're these people running around with your symbols and your flags and your Bibles, honking your horns and having your church services, blah, blah, blah. This is a validating moment for you. Yeah. And now they feel empowered. And if they lose the White House this week or this month, they will see it as an attack on their God as part of a holy war. And I worry that many of them will resort to some sort of a violent crusade on behalf of their God. And I genuinely fear for the safety of many of my fellow Americans. Oh, we we watch. Um, we're all terrified watching uh, the news at the moment. I mean, um, to 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 think about a country that started centuries ago with uh, the founding fathers, who started as uh, uh, deists at best, and probably had a lot more nuanced um, understanding of the Bible. 
Yeah. Uh, and then we come to the 21st century. We're talking about uh, people like William Lane Craig. And I think that's probably a good segue to, to go back into religion. Um, William Lane Craig, you know, uh, who's adopted the Kalam cosmological argument, which is actually by Al-Ghazali, who is a Muslim um, a philosopher and scholar, scholar uh, invoking wrong science to say that everything has a cause, must, you know, uh, uh, everything that exists must have a cause, and therefore God exists. Um, uh, and then having debates with the like of um, Sean Carroll, uh, the physicist, to explain to him that causality does not exist um, in that way, where at the singularity there isn't before, or uh, you need time for causality to work because you first have the intention of doing something. It's like in the Bible, and God, you know, created light, and then He saw the light, and He saw it was good. You know, so there is like progression that requires time. And we know the sing singularity, the, the the word before and after and where, these things are incomprehensible. They they, they did so the the causation um, situ situation isn't really invoked. So they're using completely misinformation and wrong signs to show uh, probably the um, unsophisticated uh, reader or listener, oh, this could have some signs behind it and therefore it must be legitimate. But evangelical Christian, Christianity is, 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 is coming very, very strongly within the U.S. and their understanding of the Bible is quite frightening. It's, uh, I have two thoughts on that. First of all, it's interesting, William Lane Craig and his constant reliance on the Kalam cosmological argument. Everything that was created uh, began to exist, you know, kind of thing. But the creator himself doesn't have to have a cause, right? Okay. Um, but that's not even an argument for Christianity. It's this weird, vague, deistic argument about some watchmaker who set the universe in motion. After he makes the cosmological argument, Craig has to then make this huge jump to his specific religion, which is Christianity. And he doesn't even make, if you go to his website and read his arguments for, they're not even arguments for, he just decides, well, you know, the universe had a creator and that creator is my specific God with a proper name. Uh, how did you get there? Well, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it, it makes no sense on his website. It was just like, what? It, this is not even an argument. Also, uh, talking about the United States, there's this interesting phenomenon that's happening. We see the power grab by the Christian nationalist. Catherine Stewart has written about this in her book, The Power Worshippers. But there's a massive frantic grab going on right now to stack the courts, to stack the positions of power, to stack the White House, to stack the public schools with Christianity. And I think one of the reasons for this mad power grab is that the demographics of the United States are becoming more and more non-religious. 26% of citizens of the United States identify right now, one quarter, identify as non-religious. Not necessarily atheists, but religion does not play a real part in their lives. They're not interested. They're doing other things. So, you know, seeing the writing on the wall, the Christian nationalists lose their minds. Because, wait a minute, we're becoming increasingly secular and they're not interested in my specific dogma. Well, we better consolidate power while we can. And speaking to your earlier point about the ground up uh, cultural change that must inform the leadership, I genuinely do hold hope that as we continue to become less, and it's a slow climb to become less and less religious, that then their representatives, the representatives of these people in the halls of power will reflect that. So we will finally see more openly secular, openly atheists, um, senators and Republican or uh, uh, House of Representative leaders, representatives, mayors and governors, and ultimately presidents and vice presidents, because that's a reflection of a culture that is less interested in dogmatism and a specific religion. And, uh, you know, do I think that'll happen in my lifetime? I, I don't, I don't know, you know, maybe in a few decades when I'm 75, maybe, <laughs> maybe it'll happen. I, mean, I, it's, I think it's going to be a slow climb and it's going to be a dirty, nasty fight. These people will not go quietly. They are not going to relinquish the, the reins of power quietly. They're going to fight tooth and claw and it's going to be a bloody, nasty battle. And I, I'm, I'm, again, I'm concerned for our future, but I'm hoping that perhaps this is a growing pain 
and that we will evolve past all of this madness sometime in my lifetime. Yeah. I mean, we had the first black um, American president, and uh, I think the ne next one will be a female one. And uh, I think atheist must be one of the very last because uh, in a recent poll, as you know, the poll, the very famous poll, um, uh, Americans believe uh, atheists are on par with um, with rapists and, rapists and other. Yeah, so it's uh, it's uh, hopefully that will change up at, at some point. And you know, you can end up with an atheist president. That still does not guarantee that you're gonna have a a competence one you know it's a again one more time i mean we keep telling people that atheism is is a position based on one thing one question about the existence of all of life and you can end up being a horrible person and an atheist and it does not really tell all what it tells me is okay you don't believe in god how you got there is a big thing as well there are people who don't believe in god for the wrong reasons um uh, may, may, you know they're just a, a spur of the moment decision because they think praying is too much work for them i i, I don't really put value on that the the reason why you take a position sometimes is more important the than the position itself because that tells me how you are going to behave in the future um uh, or with regards to different uh, other matters what, what do you think about that it's funny you know I, i've often said that i've i've met beautiful christians and i've met horrible atheists ultimately you know it's what kind of a human being are you? I mean, I'm married to a Christian, for Pete's sake. Uh, we have our disagreements about theology, but she's a beautiful human being. And we share our value system is about the same. So, uh, you know, and she's really a casual, cultural Christian. She's not really engaged in the church at all, which probably makes the difference. But, you know, uh, the this I, I've met, I, when I first came into atheism, I remember thinking, well, you know, if you're an atheist, you're, a, you're, you're going to embrace science. And you're going to be uh, a humanist. You're going to be all these amazing things because atheism. And that was a baptism by fire because then I, I soon realized there's some horrible people out there who are waving the atheist banner. There are irrationalists. I was in Chicago at a speaking engagement. I met a flat earther <laughs> atheist. How is that possible? How, wait, how can you be? All right, you've rejected God and you think the earth is a disc. How does this happen? And, and I've met all kinds of, of people who, you know, they, uh, you're absolutely correct that atheism is not a guarantee of rationalism. It's not a guarantee of goodness. And so at the end of the day, I sure would like to see us try to focus on what we do have in common in terms of our values. And, uh, you know, we can have the conversation about God. It's an important one. But I'm more interested in whether or not you're a good person. Are you kind? Are you respectful? Do you keep your word? Do you work hard? Do you genuinely care? And uh, that's what I want to cultivate in my own country. And I feel that way even about our elected official. Look, Biden's a practicing Catholic. All right, whatever. But you know what? He's also a guy who's going to protect a woman's right to choose despite his Catholic church, uh, church's edicts about abortion. He doesn't want to discriminate against gay people, despite his own church's position on gay people. He understands that, you know, if he has a personal ideology, his religion doesn't dictate that in a representative republic. So you know, atheist, religious, whatever, my biggest concern right now is, are you a good human being? And I'd like to see a greater focus on goodness for all of us in, in the future. Because we sure haven't seen it. You know, Donald Trump's calling card is cruelty. Cruelty. Reveling in cruelty toward anybody and everybody. Think of a, a day where there hasn't been a speech or a soundbite or a news clip or an interview or a tweet where he has not. He is cruel on a day-to-day -day basis. I don't want my country to be defined by the cruel. Yeah, I want to be defined by humanity. You know, getting in touch with the best I parts remember. of ourselves. I remember a tweet of his uh, that got me sort of laughing hysterically uh, in disgust at the same. I'm, I'm, I've never had so many confusing emotions uh, reacting to one tweet when his brother died. And he said, rest in peace, my brother. He was my biggest fan and he hated China. And, and I was like, okay, well, it was nothing to do with his brother whatsoever. This is again. <laughs> oh, talking look, about when, when uh, at 9-11, right, the towers fell. And people died by the thousands, and it was a tremendously, it was an unspeakably horrible moment. And when he was interviewed, as the buildings were burning, 
his first thought and what he said was, well, I used to have the second tallest building in New York, but now I've got the first. He, as, as people were dying by the thousands, his first thought was self-aggrandizement. This is, this is sociopathy. Mm. This is the, the action and word of a malignant narcissist. And it terrifies me that tens of millions of my fellow countrymen and women admire and love that. Uh, he says, I could go on Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and my, my popularity would increase. He was right. How terrifying is that? Uh, yeah. He calls people hor the most horrible of names. He's a child, a petulant, tantrum-throwing child. Who responds positively to that? What does that say about us? And I, I've I've come to the moment in my life when I'm not out there trying to convince those people to be good because I've had no luck. I'm out there thinking I'm going to represent the humanity that I think we should be. I'm going to push through them. I'm going to vote past them. I'm going to represent the kind of country I want in the hopes that they one day will be relegated to the history books. Yeah. I think a lot of religious people sort of associate with Trump because he, if you, when you think about it, the, the, the attributes you sort of given him are very similar to a certain character in the Bible, you know, that capricious uh, yeah. person who, you know, does things in his own way. Um, Seth, we, we've been uh, on air for an hour, 45 minutes and time flew uh, in a very comfortable and uh, I'm loving the conversation, but I don't want to take much of your time, and I would love you to um, uh, to to sort of finish up with with um, maybe uh, addressing a question uh, from me. Uh, so you, we leave religion. Um, we spend the first few years being a bit angry, trying to vent our spleen and um, you know show the world how wrong they could be about certain things eventually come to terms with things and you can't really change people's minds overnight and the whole situation should be a dialogue. Uh, we are often accused of, uh, well, atheistic life must be quite empty and must be quite dry and, uh, you know, what motivates you? What makes you moving? Are you guys just all about science and facts and no arts? And, and what, are, what about the numinous and uh, that the Christopher Hitchens was talking about? Can we, as an, uh, well, atheist slash writer, video maker, a father, you've got two beautiful dogs I, I can always see on your Facebook, and all these different hobbies. You're a complex as a human being. Can we reject or not be persuaded of the existence of God, lead good lives, and contribute to the beauty and the human experience? Yeah, I, I hear this quite a bit. Um, often it comes in the form of, well, if there's no heaven, what's the purpose of being alive? Why bother living? if you're only temporary. And I just think that's tragic because I think if you think you're going to live forever, it cheats the preciousness of this life. Like if you think, if you realize you're on the clock, there's no evidence for life 2.0, then you have a much more critical need to say the words and to pursue the goals and dreams and, and you know, solve the problems because Jesus isn't going to show up and sweep up, and we're not going to go somewhere else so we can trash you know, it. It affects almost everything we do, and I think the fragility and the temporary nature of life actually makes it much more precious. I like to say it like this: I say, you know, my favorite song has a final note. Should I not enjoy the song? My I ate a delicious meal; it has a final bite to the meal. Should I not enjoy the meal? I love someone who dies prematurely. Should I have not loved them because it was temporary, our time together? I think the temporary nature of much of this actually makes it a lot more, more precious. And I think it focuses us. And, you know, all right, fine. It, would it be nice to live longer? Would it be nice to have a mansion and, you know, pearly gates and rainbows and and, you know, be reunited with the dogs and all those things. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, sure. But, you know, what I want and what I like and what sounds pretty, that's not how we determine what is true. So for the time that I have here, I'm going to do my best to create a better world. I don't need to have my purpose handed to me. 
you know, I think we generate our own sense of purpose. It's a tremendously liberating thing. Find what you love. Find who you are. What are you passionate about? What are your interests? What are your goals? You can set those on your terms and then do that. And that allows you, you know, a tremendous sense of satisfaction. You aren't being told who you are. You get to decide and discover who you are. And you get to sort of work toward the goals and dreams and things that you wanted to work toward. I have found much more satisfaction in a godless, atheistic life than I ever found as a, a, a believer in God. I'm more true to myself. I feel more comfortable in my own skin. I have more joy and satisfaction. And if someone gave me the opportunity to take the pill to go back to my, uh, my religious belief, I'd never take it. Even if I thought I was going to live forever and if I thought I was, you know, adopted by a divine king and all those things, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to go back to that because it's not honest. It's not real. There's much more satisfaction, even in a temporary life, rooting yourself in the real living life on your own terms, an authentic life. Well, completely in agreement. I mean, invoking the horror movies that we both love, we, we can see sophisticated um um, dealing with the eternity and how boring it could be. You get characters like Dracula and Bram Stoker's uh, vampire who's gagging to die and end it all because that eternal life is seeing people loving and dying throughout ages. And people like Cain from the TV series Lucifer who's <laughs> trying to stage his own death in too many different ways because he had enough. And... Uh, Yes, I think eternal life will be a very boring one, a very boring existence. <laughs> Plus, you know, if you hold to the Bible and you spend all of eternity just praising God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. I mean, that's not heaven. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, essentially it's servitude. And uh, you're there to validate somebody else. It's not, heaven's not really about you, you know, and about the things that you love. And that doesn't sound like heaven to me. Not to me either, Seth. Seth, I'd like to thank you so much. I, I, I loved our conversation. I hope that we can repeat this experiment uh, maybe next year. <laughs> That's only a few months to go now. Uh, but thank you so much. And uh, the audience here loved every minute of it. No, you're very kind. It's a wonderful conversation. And I wish all my best to you and your audience, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you all for watching Critical Faculty. Uh, Hani Salim was with you and the great Seth Anders.